Okay, so good afternoon and welcome everyone to the second session in our collaborative series between Sons Consulting and Microsoft. We're delighted that you're able to join us and uh, this afternoon Elliot and I are going to speak for around 30 to 40 minutes but we will allow plenty of time for questions. We're going to stop at the end of each of our sections and allow time for questions then and we'll also allow time at the end and we'll also address those that uh, were pre-submitted so thanks very much to everyone who's done that already this afternoon. To briefly recap for those new to the series, in the first webinar we set the scene for change, noting that coming into the year, 61% of universities reported a financial deficit, which was already leading to efficiency measures. Layer on to this, an increasingly competitive global marketplace, COVID and the fact that your audience expectations are changing, and now more than ever is the time to become an efficient, agile and effective organisation. Despite the expected increase in student numbers over the coming years, as we've heard already, benefiting from this surge is not a right or an entitlement. Gen Z and Gen Alpha have very different attributes and expectations from their predecessors. The sorts of um, social media activity that this generation will engage with have not even been developed yet, and their familiarity with Amazon is something the rest of the world should be paying close attention to. With over half of children talking to Alexa already, comfort with voice interaction is only going to get stronger. And providing an industry leading customer experience requires marketeers to focus on the individual and provide a truly personalised experience, regardless of the channel being used to communicate. Therefore, now is the time to ensure that your teams are able to leverage the data and the content that you create to enable you to design personalised student journeys. So at the end of the last session, we said we'd share with you what good CX looks like. We should highlight at this point that what we're not going to do is design a student journey here and now this afternoon, as that would be very poor practice. But what we will do is share with you what we think makes good customer experience. And that really is a deep understanding of your audience. And this in turn will enable you to design good customer journeys time and time again. So for us, what good, like, good looks like is to ensure that you're aware of and keeping abreast of demographic changes. As we've just noted, the expectations of Gen Z and Gen Alpha are changing and you need to ensure you're keeping abreast of these macro behavioural attitude and expectation changes. You need to ensure that the data and insight is at the heart of your offer. And we mean this in terms of your course portfolio development, your student experience, your prospective student engagement, and of course, your customer journeys across all audiences. The stories that you find in your data will give you insight into many things. So subject trends, satisfaction with interactions, behavioral trends amongst your prospective students, and of course, your internal efficiency benchmarks, as well as much, much more. You also need to deliver an omni-channel experience. This means meeting your students where they are and consider the entire experience from their point of view. Generally speaking, your audience would rather solve issues on their own than reach out and engage with you. Therefore, you can also help them help themselves by ensuring that you're using data driven content and by implementing a fresh approach to good content design. And we'll cover this a bit more later on. You need to make sure that you're tailoring your offer. So we talk a lot about personalization and what, we, what do we mean by that, which we'll cover a lot later on in the session. But your communications and engagement towards student personas can go a long way as it increases the chances of your content and comms resonating with your target audience. This gives them a greater sense of reason to believe and reason to belong and is proven to increase conversion. So we've got some stats for you now. So Gartner reports a 25% increase in web and mobile conversion, which leads to direct income lift. And specifically within higher education, Western Sydney University reported 11% year on year increase in student retention. Whilst over at Charles Sturt University, they reported a 346% increase in conversions through personalized experience. And that was following the implement implementation of Adobe Experience Manager. So last but not least is the need to demonstrate em empathy and this obviously links very closely with personalization. The more data and insight you glean, and more importantly used to personalize the student experience, this will enable you to demonstrate more thoughtful and efficient responses to better meet their needs. It's widely accepted that the UK HE sector is behind the curve in being able to deliver all of this currently, but it is so important that you start to enable yourself to use the data, glean ongoing insight, analyse what's working and what isn't working to maximise your marketing strategies. 
Ultimately, in our view, you need to apply um, customer centricity and have the right technology in place to do the heavy lifting in terms of data, AI, analytics, machine learning and so on. So today, Elliot and I are going to share some quick wins to help you make a shift in your approach if you're not already doing so, as we appreciate many of you will be doing so already. So I'm going to start with the te non-technology based quick wins and hand over to Elliot to cover the tech landscape. However, people and technology are not mutually exclusive. They are innately codependent and they need to work hand in hand to complement one another and make sure that um, ultimately you're able to maximise operational effectiveness. And we'll cover more on this later on as well. So if you recall, we made the point previously that student recruitment journeys are far from linear and they don't fit the neat boxes that the sector often applies to them. So our first quick win is around understanding your audience journeys. And in order to improve things, first and foremost, you need to understand the journeys that your customers are taking. Now, we do have a short poll for you now. So we're going to do a bit of audience participation this afternoon. So bear with us. So you'll see now on your screen that you've got a QR code that you can scan with your phone. Or you can head over to slido.com and enter sums. And with a bit of technical support here from Elliot, we'll give you a few moments for you to um, submit your responses. We're all going to have a go. It shows whether we've actually got anybody on the other end of the line. <laughs> so just give you one more minute to complete that. There's plenty of people who haven't yet uh, haven't yet responded. So let's see if people are getting to grips with Slido. OK, that's fine. We'll give you a couple more minutes. <laughs> We've got plenty of time. We'd rather you engage them. Than... We've got we've got five responses in. We know there's 50 odd people here this afternoon, so we'll give you a few more minutes. The vast majority are saying no, which is interesting. OK, so that is interesting. So and those of you that have done it, looks like you've only done it for some of your customer segments as well, rather than all of them. So. OK, there's still some coming in, Elliot, or should we? Yeah, they're, they're slowly trickling in and we can uh, if, if if we get a huge flurry and it changes the results, we can always come back to them later. But yeah, I think uh, we've had 10 responses, so about 20 percent response rate with the vast majority of people um, saying not at all. And then, as you say, some saying yes, yes for some cons uh, segments. OK, super. Well, I'm just going to head back to sharing my slide deck. So hopefully you can now see that in front of you as well. And um, so as we just said, that's really interesting to see and quite a mixed bag of responses, although the majority are saying no. Um, and hopefully this gives you something that you can consider in your own organisation. It's also important to remember that for even those of you that have done this recently, this is something that you shouldn't just do as a one off. You should be validating those student journeys, continuing to iterate and test and continuously improve. And some of the hopefully practical solutions that Elliot and I are going to give you this afternoon will help you to do that. OK, so. So Sums Consulting, obviously we want to make the point that we are well placed to help you in your user journey mapping and we've got an example for you this afternoon uh, with the University of West of England. So UWE wanted to look to improve the student digital experience by procuring a new student CRM system and this formed part of their student journey programme. So we run a series of workshops looking at specific categories of students and their experience from potential prospects right through to alumni. The director of the strategic programs office and his team then used this mapping process to look at the experience of all of their UE students, considering what their needs might be at each stage and what they could do to improve their journeys. UE's business change managers also attended the workshop so that they could learn how to do this for continuous process improvement, because as we've said, this isn't something you should just do as a one off. The targeted journeys that were developed during the process, such as for international students coming to the UK for the first time or care leavers, for example, helped to focus the university on the best way they could support each and every experience. This has been seen from recruitment right through to retention. And these journeys have now fed into the requirements for their CRM system, which has been successfully procured, as well as providing sort of a broader framework, really, for them to do continuous improvement process. So that's one example. However, you shouldn't just look at this from the user end. 
The other side of this is also to understand and map the journey from an internal perspective. Now, I should say here that we are not advocating that you design student journeys based on internal workflow, but what mapping your internal processes will do is enable you to identify where painful uh, experiences may be happening for your prospective students and identify internal improvements that can be made in order to improve operational efficiency and customer experience. So for example, you might analyse your internal workflow and identify processes that are carried out regularly, but perhaps it requires copying information between various systems or relies on various versions of a prospect's record. And I'm sure all of us who have worked in universities are familiar with this. So you could look at how automation tools could be used to minimise manual data transfer and maximise efficiencies. And Elliot is going to cover more on this later on on the tech side. In the meantime, I'm going to cover some examples of where SUMS Consulting have helped institutions to support them reviewing their internal processes, but also their user journey mapping um, to use more examples than just UE. And this has resulted in a number of recommendations that are now being implemented. So our first example is over at the University of Hull, and we completed an independent review for them of their existing clearing and confirmation processes and proposed improvements for this current cycle. They were obviously keen to make sure that they were optimising efficiency and effectiveness, maximising conversion of their applicants, and they had an ambition to improve that on 12% from the previous year. And finally, they wanted to make sure, obviously, that they've got good systems, processes and infrastructure in place to ensure that clearing and confirmation runs effectively. So the approach we took included mapping out their current state business processes and systems, evaluating the quality of what we call the current state journeys. Um, so this would be, for example, offer turnaround times, the ease of their SITS navigation because they use SITS up at Hull, their channel access in terms of web inquiries, live inquiries, telephone inquiries and so on. We also assess their system and resource implications for moving to their desired future state, including an operational review of any changes to SITS as their system. So as a result of the work that we undertook, we identified many tactical quick wins, as well as some deeper cultural and team development change opportunities, which would facilitate the university in meeting its objectives. Our recommendations ranged from review of training to improve the confidence and quality of the handlers, the inquiry handlers, SITS form navigation improvements, and we also identified opportunities to enhance conversion between offer to enrolment. And to do this, we also looked, we sort of scanned really the, the reports across the sector. So, for example, we know from Net Natives and National Clearing Study that ease and speed of offer is really important to inquiries during clearing. The busiest period for inquiries is the first four hours of A level results day, and 60% of students expect an offer to be made within 60 minutes. Some evidence suggests that applicants are more likely to accept an offer from the university that makes them the first offer. Um, and a good proportion of offers are accepted and registered within two to three days. However, the work that we undertook for Hull highlighted that several offers were taking days to resolve and convert into registered students. And at this point for them, they were losing over 50 students in that final stage. So lastly, we suggested a clear set of metrics and targets be introduced to measure the speed of delivery through the different stages of clearing. And this is to help sharpen focus and operational delivery, but also again to set some benchmarks for continuous improvement. The report that we did was well received and although some of the recommendations have had to be put on hold due to the COVID crisis, uh, many of the recommendations are being implemented as we speak. Our other case study is over at the University of Leicester. So their future students office commissioned us to complete a business review of the university's inquiry management process. And this was following on from some concerns that were raised internally. These included, again, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with these things, a lack of a single point of entry for inquirers, a dispersed inquiry management model, incomplete inquiry management information, some inconsistent branding and messaging and fragmented systems. The team had also flagged some concerns over regulatory compliance. As we know, we've got increasingly regulatory uh, or regulations that we all have to comply with now across the, the, the board. So our approach included reviewing strategy documentation, analysis of available data, interviews with staff, a review of the current state journey again and recommendations for the future state. Once again, as for Hull, we found a number of tactical quick wins, as well as some deeper cultural and team development change opportunities. I should flag at this point that the work um, was deliberately and consciously operational in focus, as that's what the institutions had requested. But of course, doing something like this will always highlight some of the more strategic changes that could be made. 
and we wanted to make sure that there were actionable insights which the teams on the ground could implement swiftly. So over at Leicester, these include interim work to maximise the capabilities of Azurus and SITS, which are the systems they use, in the advent of a new CRM being scoped. Some organisational design changes, for example, bringing the CRM team into the future students office and some new digital technologies which will help meet their efficiency and personalisation challenges. Lastly, we advise that they create a virtual open day, which actually turned out to be very timely given the hit of then COVID happening, obviously. So as a result of our recommendations, the university has commenced a journey of centralisation of admissions and inquiries for distance learning, and they're further looking at their medical school admissions processes. They've relocated the Azuras team from marketing to the future students office, and they're looking at centralising all inquiries in the future. Their director of future students, Danielle Fitzgerald, has also noted that for Leicester, um, the current pandemic has meant that actually now more than ever, this is a really important time to do this work. So as we highlighted in the last session, we appreciate you're all facing a myriad of challenges right now, but actually this work is critical to ensure the success of your future recruitment activities. So a few case studies there for you. So once you've got a deep understanding of your student journeys, what well, in our view, this then allows you to refine your funnel, your conversion funnel, and to design and activate your marketing campaigns around the prospective student journey, rather than by organisational structure. This will enable you to shift to a data-driven organisational model, rather than one that's based on department structure, which as we know, can often be siloed and working to different agendas. On a practical level, this enables you to measure and enhance micro conversions at every level, but also enhance the overall customer journey. For example, you might identify there's a vulnerability between awareness and attraction or between accept and enrol. And by mapping the journeys more thoroughly, you're likely to identify the specific action that's needed rather than blindly throwing resources in the spray and pray approach that sometimes we know the sector can be guilty of. So a couple of examples of this, um, I'm conscious of time, so if we've got time for the other example, I'll come back to it. But one of the uh, case studies I want to mention was a newly established medical school. I worked with them to review their user journeys and it soon became clear that the value proposition was confused, the web journey was poor and they had low conversion across their funnel. The work that I did with them resulted in a number of quick win recommendations that were then implemented within weeks and resulted in a complete shift in their approach to how they designed their campaigns and activated those campaigns more importantly. One that was originally designed around institutional structure. I should also mention that this particular example was two universities in collaboration, so it was even more complex than just one big multifaceted organisation. And as I say, it led to some really quick wins for them. I'm going to cover content design later, which was my other example. So I'll come back to that in just a moment. So later in the session, you're going to hear from Elliot on the enhanced technology that's available to automate the content design process. I've already mentioned Adobe Experience Manager, um, and that's one of the examples we've got for you. But in the meantime, there is proven value in moving to a new way of working, one that doesn't rely on technology to embed a more customer centric approach to content design and also to educate your wider stakeholders in this new way of being. So my example here is a leading university who recently implemented a new approach to content design. Now I should say that their shift in their way of working is part of a broader transformation piece, but actually the content design piece that they've, they've already implemented was very swift to implement and is already seeing positive outcomes. And this is before they've made any sort of technology investment or technology changes. So it's based on an approach which some of you may have heard of. It's been designed and championed by Sarah Richards, who is a leading expert in content design. And she was also responsible for a website that we all use, the YouGov website revamp, which was a huge revamp. Um, and I'm sure we're all familiar with it. We are also all too familiar with the, with the request. Please put this on your website. Academics who are insistent on using reams of academic language in their course pages or to design content around an event or stage in the process. But we as marketeers know we should do better than this. It should be based around consumer need. However, we appreciate the challenges around implementing this approach when working with academic departments who, let's just say, sometimes have strong views on their content. As Sarah Richards highlights in her work, Good content design is based around user need and she advocates the message, assume nothing, question everything, test until you're sure and then go and do it again. You'll see there's a theme coming through the work that we're doing. 
So Sarah's approach is refreshingly simple, although if we're honest, it's something we should have been doing for a long time. And I think sometimes um, convince ourselves we are doing, which is putting the user first. The trouble is all too often, our teams don't have the time or resources to find out what users really need or care about. As our deadlines loom, we begin to allow our assumptions to steer the direction of our content design. So fundamentally, Sarah's approach to content is, is, is predicated on various stages, and that's to do discovery and development of user and job stories before you even start to design the content. Her methodology also includes something called pair writing and crits, both of which are really useful techniques to employ when writing content alongside academic colleagues who are ultimately very invested in their content. They also own and know their content better than anybody. And as at the end of the day, we know it's at the core of the product that we're all trying to sell. So lastly, Sarah focuses on the notion of caring for your content, which means before you even publish anything at all, you should know what success is for that content. When are you going to archive it? And when are you going to review it? How many of us are familiar with thousands of pages on your website? many of which, if, if we're all honest with ourselves, can be out of date and no longer looked after. This approach to content design is generally a new way of working for higher education marketing teams, but an effective one if correctly deployed. So how was this sold into the university in question? Well, they went through an internal influencing process again with our support and made sure the academic community were clear that they owned the facts and the marketing team owned the content. The notion of pair writing was hugely well received by the academic community and it's helped them shift their way of working so that they're in a better position when the technology does land, which they are investing in, to create a customer centric approach to their way of being and to influence others in this way as well. It has also removed the age old infighting around content wars and the bits of prospectus paper going back backwards and forwards that again many of our institutions are also familiar with. So a key fundamental to all that I've said today is positioning yourself as a customer centric organisation, putting insight at the heart of all you design and deliver. How many of you, and this isn't a poll, don't worry, but how many of you can say that this is your institution position currently? All of the examples I've shared today are not one offs and they should in fact be reviewed continuously on a virtuous cycle of design, test and learn, iterate and test and learn again. However, a lot of you are hampered by your technology infrastructure and therefore review and insight tends to happen periodically rather than continuously. CX can often be designed around internal workflow rather than actual journeys. As I noted earlier, people and technology are innately codependent and I'm going to shortly hand over to Elliot, who is going to showcase the technology quick wins. But before I do, I just want to highlight that we can help you make the case for change. Now, we fully recognise that digital transformation is not a quick win, but we can help you lay the foundations. And that's what we did for um, a leading Russell Group University back in 2017. So back then, Sons Consulting worked with the University of Nottingham to support them on their digital transformation journey. They had identified a need to, in their words, revolutionise the way in which they attract, recruit and engage with their prospective students across the pre-inquiry to enrolled journey. And this was by far and away a very successful university, but they still recognise the need for change. Sums Consulting were commissioned to undertake what we call an external assessment of their digital marketing capabilities, so people, process and technology. And we highlighted that the current operating model and technology platforms were not effective for their current ways of being or their future aspirations. The SUMS review identified a number of supply side inadequacies, so capacity, capability, culture, alongside, as I've just said, their issues with their technology platform and their ways of working. So what we did was we created um, a high level shape of a proposed transformation program. This was used to make the case for change internally and it helped secure the funds necessary to begin rigorous discovery, consultation and tender processes, which were in turn used to build a very sophisticated business case. The university, I'm delighted to report, has since secured executive level and business wide support for change. They've selected their preferred technology, uh, Microsoft and Adobe, their delivery partner, and most importantly, they've committed the necessary funds to start the work in 2021. So our aim through this series is to give you some practical solutions that you can implement in your own organisation. We only have time to cover a few, so please bear in mind there are many more solutions and we're here to help. 
We're HE experts and our business model, the fact that we are not for profit and owned by universities, for example, means we have very competitive rates. So please don't hesitate to reach out and we'll be very happy to discuss with you. Next time in our final series, we will be sharing further case studies of where we've helped universities make a more fundamental approach. But in time, in the meantime, that is it from me until I hand over to Elliot, although we are just going to check whether there are any questions that have come in. So Vanessa, over to you. Have we had any questions come in during the first half of the session? Yes, yes we, just we just had a, had a question. question. Okay, so great. the approach to design, design test, test and learn, iterate, test, test and learn and land, it sounds very lengthy. So how does this new approach to HE content production speed things up when it sounds really lengthy? There we go. Am I, am I back on? Back on. Can you hear me, Vanessa? OK. Yes. 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 Super. OK, so that's a good question. I think there's probably a couple of things in there that I'd say. So the first is that um, we will be talking about some of the technology that is here to facilitate and help this process. Um, and as I mentioned right at the start, to do some of the heavy lifting for you. But actually, the content process that I've just mentioned um, that is advocated by Sarah Richards, Actually, that institution, um, they, they learned it, they developed it, and as in they, they learned how to do it, they learned the process, and they've implemented it in a matter of a few months. So actually, I would say that isn't lengthy. And once you've got the key principles of it and the techniques and the tools, you can apply that right across the, the journey. So I would actually argue that that is fairly swift to implement. In terms of learning about your customer journeys, being able to validate those, Yes, uh, there is only so much you can do there without the technology to support you, but I don't want to kind of preempt some of what Elliot's going to cover. Um, so unless Elliot has anything to add at the moment, I'll probably wait until we've done his session and then we'll come back to that if that's OK. Yeah, thanks, Nessie. I'll, I'll, I'll come on to some of that. OK, have we got any other questions? Not currently. We don't have any questions that are being published, but please feel free to add them because we'll answer them throughout the session. OK, great. And we had um, a couple of pre-submitted questions. Are we going to come back to those or do we want to do those now? I think we've got time for the first one at least, Natalie. Yeah, great. OK, perfect. So I'll read the next questions that have been pre-submitted. The first one is, how would you appraise the ways of working generally between marketing, recruitment and admissions, and what opportunities does this work give to enhance these key functions outputs? OK, so thanks, Vanessa. Um, so I'd start by saying really that our approach would depend on the likely scope of whatever the university asks us to do. Um, so we would always spend some time with you um, at the outset, really setting out the terms of reference and being clear on, on what it is that you need um, as a result. But generally speaking, um, this sort of appraisal would involve a discovery phase where we spend time speaking with the relevant leadership. So whether that be a chief marketing officer, a director of external relations or whoever that may be. Um, we would also, once we've spent time speaking to them, importantly, we would also speak to, spend time speaking to the uh, actual people in the team. So your heads of division, a selection of operational staff and colleagues identified as those who regularly interact with the department um, to really get a good understanding of the current ways of working. Because often in institutions, you'll have people that you work with. So, for example, the international office that may, may or may not be based in your team already. So in our view, ultimately structures are secondary and people, processes and systems are the key factors. So in a deep dive review, we would drill into these areas, looking at critical elements such as uh, things like interdependencies, your system integration, your process handoffs. And we would also review any existing journey maps or funnel, or if you don't have those, start to map those out as a current state. Ideally, we'd undertake some primary desk-based research from an end user experience. And we'd also look at things like uh, many universities have things like acceptors and decliner surveys that also have a lot of insight in there. Um, lastly, we'd review any relevant documentation the teams might have in place, so marketing strategy or plans. We'd obviously then analyse all of our findings and pr present back a series of recommendations, much in the way that we did for Hull and Leicester, um, and that's likely to be at a tactical and a strategic level. Um, so a fundamental point, though, that I would make again is that, and one we've made throughout the series, is what we're trying to encourage organisations to do is build out this data-driven operating model rather than one that is structured around an organisational structure so that you start to think about those student journey points. Um, and I've been successful in doing this in different 
different organisations and, and, and successfully seen it happen in other places as well. So I believe we can help you. So do reach out and we'll see what we can do. Thank Lovely. you, Kat. OK, Very so I think that's it from the questions. I'm going to hand over to Elliot. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks so much. So I wanted to start this afternoon by talking through uh, the technology that I think can support some of the areas that Natalie is, uh, has spoken through this afternoon. So the the, the first thing that, I, that we wanted to start with was uh, the, the the information that Natalie shared about Sarah Richard's approach to content design. But you know, I'm I'm not a marketeer. I I haven't spent years of uh, designing content and creating content. But for me, uh, without thinking of the technology, that approach of uh, you know that that more complex um, co-creation report uh, approach sounds a bit daunting, it sounds a bit onerous, it sounds like there could be lots of heavy lifting uh, with manual intervention, but what I wanted to do this afternoon was give you some reassurance that there are plenty of tools out there, technology tools that can support you in, uh, in, in carrying out those processes. One of those tools is Adobe's Experience Manager, again, as, as, Natalie, uh, as Natalie mentioned. Now, Adobe's Experience Manager platform is a comprehensive content management platform for uh, designing websites, for designing mobile apps, for designing forms, and pretty much everything in between. And fundamentally, it enables you to manage your content and your marketing assets to, be, uh, to enable you to be consistent right across your channels. And you know, we all, we all know the benefits of that consistent brand image for your prospective students. It also allows you to be timely and personal with digital experiences. Uh, those of you that joined last time will have heard me talk about personalization as a really key critical element to all of this. But uh, most importantly for today's focus, for the, today's focus on quick wins, um, it allows you to, to automate much of this. And I talk about this as a Microsoft, as a Microsoft employee, because Microsoft and Adobe have a global strategic partnership from a sort of relationship level, but also fundamentally from a technology level. So for those of you, and I know there are plenty of you on this call that are already deeply invested in Microsoft technologies, well actually you'll be able to make use of the native integrations between Microsoft's platform and Adobe's platform to further automate these processes and gain value from this platform. So what sort of things should you be looking out for to identify that you might need a solution like this? Well the first is around governance. You know, we all know far too well that universities are traditionally large, siloed, complex, sometimes international organisations where central marketing or student recruitment teams have very little control over the sort of content that's going out there. So this can help you with uh, with those stage gates, if you like. And I, and I don't say the, the, the I don't use the word stage gates to make it sound uh, restrictive and, and almost um, uh, uh, predefined, but it gives you those steps that allow you to just make sure what is going out is the stuff that should be going out. And it does that with an appropriate level of automation, as you would hope. The next is around disconnected systems. Are you finding that actually your, your ability to execute your marketing and communications content is, is limited or is slow because your, your systems are disconnected? Well, if so, something like Adobe's Experience Manager might be able to help with that by bringing together this, this single end-to-end -end platform to manage that process. The next might be around performance management. Are you finding that actually you have no idea how well you're doing? You have no idea how well the content that you're producing is driving the results that you want to drive, such as attracting students or a particular demographic of students? Well, Adobe Solution will provide inbuilt AI driven analytics in a view and in a format of your choice for the appropriate audiences. And finally, we, we hear a lot that customers find that um, it is impossible to manage the, the, the myriad of the thousands, tens of thousands of pieces of content that are out there and, uh, and, and find those pieces of content that you might want to publish. Well, as you might expect, the, the Adobe platform has full searchability and AI tagging uh, with content suggestions. And this stuff has proven results. Natalie mentioned an HE organisation in Australia that is that is doing this earlier, and actually the hundreds and hundreds of household names that we all engage with on a day-to-day -day basis, the content that we consume outside of an education setting, uh, a lot of that will be delivered through this uh, through, through this platform. But actually, this is this is your chance to get ahead and attract students because not many higher education organisations are doing this. In the UK, I know of two that are embarking on it, but are not not doing it yet. They're embarking on it, and um, so this is this is your chance to to stand out and surface content students in a way that is going to drive the results that you wanted to drive. But actually content or automation rather shouldn't stop at content design. 
If you joined last time, you will have heard me talk about uh, automation as a linchpin of a, st uh, of a digital student recruitment journey. And so given today's focus is on quick wins, I wanted to talk about how I think Microsoft and the tools that you're already probably invested in can help bring this to life. So let's start by looking at Power Automate, previously known as Microsoft Flow, a tool that, as I say, I know many of your institutions already have in place. Now, if you've seen anything about Power Automate before, you'd have probably heard that it seamlessly allows you to connect your various applications inside and outside of the Microsoft suite to maximize your productivity, all while sitting on Microsoft's Power Platform. But what does that actually mean in terms of changing how you work? Well, let's look at an example. Let's say someone tweets about your university. Power Automate allows anybody with the appropriate permissions to create a flow that automatically follows them, sends a reply, adds them to a spreadsheet or a SharePoint list, emails you for approval, and then adds them to Dynamics 365 or any other CRM system for you to follow up. And Twitter, of course, is just one example of hundreds of out-of-the-box data sources that allow you to bring data in. But that's where Power Automate started. The platform has now evolved massively, and you can now, using robotic process automation, RPA, automate legacy processes between systems, regardless of if there's an API in place or not. So you can do away with manually extracting and copying data between old systems into other systems, a process that's obviously prone to massive error, and instead record the steps that should be taken within the tool once and allow Power Automate to do it automatically forevermore. Now, I've put this in the quick wins bucket as it allows you to integrate your legacy applications with modern transformed systems and processes without a major upfront investment or transformation program. And this can be done with Excel level code. I talk about low code, no code. This is what I mean. Excel level code, the sort of syntax we're used to writing formulas in Excel day to day by non IT users, which gives you uh, allows you to empower your teams right across the university to transform the way that the way they work for simple tasks like the Twitter example or for university wide potentially international complex processes like, for example, the journey of uh, a prospective international student through the various stages of, a, of an application. Automate is just one tool that sits on the Microsoft Power Platform. I expect you've all at least heard of, if not already using Power BI, our data visualization platform. You may be using Power Apps to develop low code, no code, I use that, that phrase again, applications across institutions to simplify processes and interfaces. But the newest member of the Power Virtual Agent family, uh, of the Power Platform uh, family, sorry, and something that absolutely continues on the themes that we've been talking about today and we spoke about in our last webinar is uh, Power Virtual Agents. So this is a tool that allows you to build chatbots that can trigger workflow and personalized conversations on your existing web platforms, all once again built with no code. But more on chatbots and communication methods later. Once again, I very consciously mention all of these as part of a webinar on quick wins because of the underlying architecture that all of these uh, all of these tools sit on. And just bear with me for 30 seconds while I just get a little bit technical. For, the, for example, if you've already invested in Microsoft Dynamics 365, and I know plenty of you on this call have, or, or at least on your journey to, that platform is built on something we call Microsoft Data Flex, Flex Pro, previously called Common Data Service. We love a rebrand at Microsoft. This is basically a sophisticated database that ensures you've got a single source of truth. What this means is you're able to tap into this data with applications other than just Dynamics 365. So Dynamics is already tapping into it, but you can also use the other applications like those on the screen to tap into that same data, to visualize complex data with Power BI, to automate legacy processes Power Automate, to build pixel perfect app, apps with Power Apps, or to drive chatbot conversations with Power Virtual Agents. And because of that underlying architecture, because of your existing investments, you're able to do that without a massive complex architecture problem, which is why a uh, program rather, although sometimes also a problem, <laughs> which is why I very consciously put this in that quick wins bucket. Now, we're gonna do a little bit more of audience interaction. So if you can get your, your browser or your phone out again to engage with Slido, um, the question that, I, that I'm asking now is, are you, as primarily non-IT teams, from what I've seen from the attendee list, currently utilizing these low-code, no-code tools? So, so these sort of user-friendly tools that don't rely on IT to, um, to, to deliver them and uh, digitize internal processes and systems. Oh, we've got some answers in already. Oh, that was the last one, apologies. So if you head on to slido.com, type in sums, 
whether this be on a on a mobile device or on on your web browser. <laughs> no idea. I had a feeling that some people might be saying no idea, which is why I was keen to add that in as an option. Okay. Got three responses. And you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't surprise me that there that, that there might be people on the call that don't necessarily have that visibility because ultimately this was, wasn't necessarily targeted at IT teams. But I think the, the key thing to take away from this is this doesn't have to be driven by IT. Of course, you might need some IT buy-in like Natalie was touching on, but ultimately these are tools that allow you as business users, if you like, those sitting in maybe a student recruitment world to, uh, to utilize these tools to transform how you're doing things. So again, six out of our 45, 50 people Responding seven. Hey, I'll move on on the, in the interest of time, but I think it's clear to see the theme there. There's there's plenty of room for potential uh, or, or to, to, to start working on these things. And in the same way as Natalie is offering some support, I, I would love to work with you and your teams to get this over the line. So I said I'd come back to talk about chatbots and virtual agents, and I wanted to call out an example of a UK university that I think is doing this really well. So Staffordshire University have a mantra of AI is the new UI. Artificial intelligence is our new user interface. And so a couple of years ago, they decided to do away with having dozens of apps for students to interact with. And I, I know that challenge all too well from my current professional life, but also in my former former world as a student union president, where the university's thoughts of uh, the university's idea of rolling out a new student app was just creating a new app for the links to the 25 other apps that already existed across the institution. So staff did away with that and they decided to replace all of those apps with a single natural language interface in the form of a digital coach called Beacon. Now, Beacon allows students to ask questions using their voice or using a sm their smartphone keyboard to find the information they need. And when this project started, those, those FAQs were really simple FAQs, kind of com um, question and answer pairs, like what time is the library open? How can I access the career service? They're, they're sort of results that you can pre-populate. But actually, as the project evolved, those, those questions and answers moved to more complex integrated use cases that pulled data in from various systems, such as, can you tell me what lectures I have this afternoon? Or what time is my appointment with student support? Now, alongside this, this is a, a kind of evolving program, but alongside this, they're rolling out Dynamics 365 to manage their wider student data lifecycle, right from um, from a, a student or a prospect's very first interaction through to graduation and beyond. So what this will then enable uh, Beacon to do would be to tap into Dynamics. So then students will be able to say things like, what is the status of my extenuating circumstances application? Or when can I expect my hardship funding? And there are a few things I want you to take away from this. And by the way, I'm very aware this isn't a student recruitment example, but I hope you can see the parallels. So a few things I want you to take away. The first is that the version of Beacon that will eventually be ready for students, that is all singing, all dancing one day, is not the version they use today. And that's OK. For too long, universities have been reluctant to run agile transformation programs, instead focusing on a waterfall methodology. So instead focusing on a waterfall methodology, which takes much longer and doesn't react to feedback. The students that we work with are very used to the platforms that they use changing regularly. Just look at Snapchat or TikTok or Facebook as examples. Focus on an MVP, a minimal viable product, and iterate over time. The second thing I want you to take away is the simplicity of the platform, the very intentional simplicity of this delivery. There's not a reliance on students knowing a university's complex structure for them to be able to get the help they need. They just have to use their natural language to ask those questions, and that should be a focus to drive engagement. And finally, the first version of Beacon was delivered in a matter of weeks, and it's because they were utilising the platforms that they'd already invested in across Microsoft. Consolidation of technology ecosystems is critical to enable you to be agile and innovative with progress projects like this. The next example I want to share with you is in the form of a video from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Now, I'll let Dr. David Kellerman tell you more about the work he's done. But what I hope you take away from this is the potential for responsive, personalised experiences with very little heavy lifting. Like the staff's example, this isn't focused on a student recruitment journey, but the concepts are entirely transferable. So I want to talk about leveraging AI for a second. What's possible with an integrated system?
system? Well, meet QuestionBot. QuestionBot is a bot that we created in order to solve this problem, and it was built by partners who are right here today, Antaro Solutions. So it's a simple value proposition, right? Students tag the question bot, it looks up which tutorial group they're in, looks up who their TA is, tags it, TA gets a notification on their phone, answers wherever they're at, and question bot closes the service ticket by being told what the correct answer was. So it's actually keeping track of question and answer pairs. It's helping everyone connect, and every Q&A pair is there inside the specific topic. And of course today, if it doesn't work on mobile, it doesn't work. So QuestionBot is actually creating a study resource for the students, filtered by topic. It's not a textbook, it's made out of their own collaboration, their own discussions automatically. In fact, in the first two weeks alone, QuestionBot created 200 high quality topic filtered question and answer pairs. Now imagine six times that. So a used Q&A maker, a cognitive service on Azure, in order to train the AI of the bot. And within a couple of weeks, it started answering questions on its own. But not just that, QuestionBot was also able to direct the students back to the conversations where their peers had been talking about similar problems. That's reconnecting people and building learning communities. So, there's another problem. A lot of students would upload photos for their questions. And there's no context within the question that they've asked to build a high quality question and answer pair. So I started putting QR codes on all of the learning material. And using a vision cognitive service, QuestionBot was able to see what question the students were working on and say, hey, I see you're working on question 4.1. Pull relevant information from its own knowledge base deliver more useful assets to the students. And remember those lecture recordings that were on stream? Well, it's a SharePoint asset, and QuestionBot could find it there with no configuration. It's able to search the transcript, and if the answer to a student's question happens to be in the lecture, it can deliver a time-stamped video link to the exact second. Using Graph API and Bot Framework, we built and deployed this with just one developer in eight weeks. You know, the fire hose of conversation turned from a problem into a digital asset for us and the students. So, like I said, not a uh, not a student recruitment example, but hopefully you can see how uh, that institution, the University of New South Wales in Sydney and uh, Dr. David Kalman, were able to take and utilize the technologies they'd already invested in and, uh, and, and utilize and drive student engagement, all delivered in a matter of weeks, focusing on the end user, again, as I say, while utilizing existing uh, technology investments. of technology investments, uh, you can see on the screen here, I've put uh, a, a wheel which outlines the applications and services that we now talk about as part of the Microsoft Business Applications Platform with our core Dynamics 365 apps around that, uh, uh, the outside of that inner wheel. So you've got the Power Platform, then you've got our core Dynamics 365 apps. Now, again, from looking at the attendee list, I know several of the institutions represented are invested in Dynamics 365 customer service, for example. Well, as long as you have at least 20 users of that application, of Dynamics 365 customer service, you get access included to Dynamics 365 for marketing, for example, an enterprise grade application that allows you to automate your customer journeys and provide a level of personalized content. So if you want to start with some quick wins, make sure you're considering the team, the tools that you already have skills in and may already be paying for. Now we're going to do our final bit of audience interaction from a uh, from a polling perspective. So if you can get your, uh, as I said, your browsers or your your mobile phones ready while the next question loads, and this one is um, a little bit how you're feeling, I guess, as we as we approach the end of the session. What one word, based on everything you've heard, would you use to describe how you feel about adopting some of these tools and these ways of working? Oh, excited. That's a good one. That's that's always what we want to hear. 
I guess the what what we what we hope you take from today, and please don't let us steer answers, but um, you know these are these are potentially big projects, but ultimately they they are quick wins that allow you to drive real engagement and results. And I think a combination of uh, of technologies, but also service redesign, if you like, as as uh, as Natalie touched on, is um is is almost the perfect combination to start working towards these. The size of the word represents how many times it's been used. So I'm excited to see the word excited growing. <laughs> Apprehensive, I think I think that's a, a really fair response, uh, especially at a time of such uncertainty in the sector at the moment. Relieved is good to hear. I'm relieved. <laughs> I hope that relieved is maybe because you're doing the right things. Motivated, amazing. I think we're going to take screenshots of these and uh, let them form part of the work we do going forward. Cool. Well, I'm going to I'm going to move on um, just so we can uh, uh, so we can make sure we finish on time and give you some some of your afternoon back. But thanks for for engaging with that. So the last thing we uh, wanted to cover was questions. So Vanessa, uh, over to you once more. Have we had any other questions come in? We don't have any questions yet, but I could read through the pre-submitted question. Yeah, please do. We think we've got a couple more pre-submitted. So in the last sort of five minutes, do you mind covering those for us? Yes, of course. So what sort of support is available from SUMS and Microsoft if we decide to move forward to implement some of the solutions you talk about? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm happy to cover the from the Microsoft side first, um, and I, and this is a this sounds a bit of a copper answer, but it kind of depends. So it sort of depends on the how you go about that project. So for example, is it a Microsoft Services delivered project? Is it a, a Microsoft Partner delivered project? As as many of our projects often are, um, and it also depends on the sort of the relationship that you've got with Microsoft already. So the vast majority of you on this call will have a designated account executive, for example, someone who works within the sector, understands how Education, looks after you and probably about another 10, 15 customers. So really pretty focused on the work that you're doing and uh, is your go to person for all things Microsoft. And they can introduce you to people like myself, uh, a, a Dynamics 365 business application specialist in education, someone like Vanessa, who you've heard talk, who is our technical specialist aligned to to business applications, somebody like a technical account manager who can go a little bit deeper or an architect. So there's plenty of tools out there. And, and I guess my my main piece of practical advice would would be to engage us early, engage your account executive early to see how they might be able to um, to, to, to support you and, and and support you in driving these projects and also help work with someone like Sums to, uh, to to build out what that business case looks like. We do a lot of, of of what we call business value. So looking at the the actual hard and cold facts that the sector, uh, the wins that the sector have seen and how you might be able to see similar wins. Natalie, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I just say, obviously, again, I something actually I omitted to mention earlier that appreciate again, some of the people that are on the webinar today are already SUMS members. So if you're already a SUMS member, uh, depending on what level member you are, your organisation is at, you have so many consultancy days included in your offer. Um, so as part of your package. So I guess the first thing to do is to understand whether you're a member and if you are, whether you've got any consultancy days left. And then we could obviously talk to you about what that what that looks like. But even if you're a member or a non-member, SUMS are still available to help you. And if you've used all your consultancy days for example but you remember then you get um, a specific rate day rate um, allocated to you and if you're a non-member then um, for example the, the piece I, I gave as an example earlier with the University of Nottingham they are actually not a SUMS member um, but we did that as a, as a non-member piece of work but they came to SUMS because of the kind of higher education experience the expertise that's there and I think as was included on one of the quotes earlier where we've worked with organisations they feel that one of the key benefits of working with SUMS is that we are higher education experts, so we do understand the sector. We understand the environment you're working in. You're not having to kind of get us up to speed with the environment first and foremost. Um, Lovely. So yeah, so I just say really that the key message for us is is reach out and um, and we'd be happy to talk to you and, and look at what that that scoping that piece of work and what that might look like. Amazing. Thanks so much. So that brings us to the end of our questions and this afternoon session. So thanks again for your engagement throughout this afternoon. We hope that you'll be interested in joining us for our, our third and final webinar in this series on Thursday, the 27th of August, where we'll discuss how you weave some of these quicker wins into your longer term student recruitment strategy. We'll also be then continuing these discussions at a SUMS and Microsoft Community of Practice Group in October. Keep an eye on your emails for a confirmed date. 
thanks again for joining us today. We really appreciate it if you could take a moment to provide us with a little bit of feedback using the short survey you'll be sent by email. But for now, all the best with clearing and we hope to see you next time. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks, Elliot.